I was um, a pilot, a C-47 pilot for the 27th Troop Carrier Squadron, served in China, uh, uh, and they were part of the 14th Air Force, Claire Chenault's, General Chenault's uh, Air Force. Anyway, um, I was based in Yunnan, Yi, China, which is Yunnan, China, the western province, and that's where the uh, Burma Road came into China. and. Uh, and where I was heavily involved when I first got to the squadron was heavily involved. Uh, reopening, uh, helping the Chinese to reopen the Burma Road. My brother, I had an older brother who was two years ahead of me that was at Stillwater at Oklahoma a &M. and And uh, a couple of weeks after December the 7th, like right before Christmas, we went, we hitchhiked a ride, and, you know, then you'd hitchhike back to Oklahoma City from Stillwater to enlist. And uh, the Marine, he wanted to go in the Marines, I wanted to go into the Army Air Corps. And at that time they still required two years of college for, a, for pilot training. And Dick, my brother, was in ROTC, advanced ROTC, so the major, uh, Marine major that we talked to, he advised us both to go back to school and they'd use us later on, so that's what we did. I'd never flown in, in an airplane at that point, but I'd Became interested when I was a kid, you know, uh, in airplanes. Uh, Lindbergh was uh, a hero. I was about, let's say, 29. I was six years old, but I remember reading about Lindbergh. And I remember Admiral Berg, when he was in the North Pole, going to the North Pole, how he used a tri-motor for it. It always kind of interested me, and then I built model airplanes, so I really had an interest. We'd been to... Um, church and we're on our way back um, and I was a freshman at this fraternity uh, frater and went back to the fraternity house. I always had coffee and donuts after mass, after church and um, we got back and everybody was talking about, it was around noontime and everybody was talking about this big bombing of Pearl Harbor uh, and uh, most of us, like myself, I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was, except they'd mentioned Honolulu, and I knew now. But by this point, uh, by this time, it was in Honolulu, so it was a. Uh, everybody was in kind of shock and uh, angry. Well, you know, kind of put out with what was happening, and that was about basically what I remember. Uh, mostly kind of in shock. At the end of my freshman year. Um, so that'd be in June of uh, 42, they dropped the requirement for two years of college uh, to become an aviation cadet. So I, uh, I enlisted in September of 42. Uh, I guess it was about September when we found out the, that requirement had been dropped. But there were so many of us tried to enlist at that time because of the lower requirement that they didn't. They had to form a pipeline, you might say, and I, I wasn't. I, I didn't actually go on uh, active duty, you might say, until January of '43. But I enlisted in September '42, and then went back to my uh, another semester of college before I went in. I actually went in. This is Oklahoma City. We got on a train and we we're going to Wichita Falls, Texas, which is only 150 miles, but it took the train 12 hours to get there. You know, it was. I don't know why it took it so long, but anyway, it, it wasn't that traumatic, uh, if I recall correctly. You know, at that time, uh, everybody was, I thought, at that time anyway, were more current and current. We were up to date on current affairs. Uh, I was in, you know, in high school in 1939 when war started in Europe, uh, and I was, I remember in 1937 being uh, aware of Japanese invading China, uh, being aware that they invaded Manchuria, so uh, we had really followed them in school, and we had we had to stay current and current. We had to stay up to date on current events. I remember one of the exams that we took for the uh, aviation cadet program was on current events, and uh, I don't even know whether they do that today, but. We had a pretty good grasp of things, I thought, at the time, or I thought I had a pretty good grasp. Wichita Falls was a basic training uh, center, 
and um, the first thing you meet your corporal, uh, he's charge of quarters, this, you know, he's a regular Air Force guy and they had a raspy voice. He's a, he's a drill sergeant too, uh, an ID, an uh, instructor, what does ID mean? Uh, anyway, and then there was sergeants. Uh, the first day was getting acquainted with uh, getting up early and standing out for, you know, roll call and when they came to Jones, it was always which one, and that sort of thing. And but it was a it was a, a busy time. It was about six weeks, if I recall. And they really uh, kept us busy. You know, not only learning how to march. Well, we were in ROTC. Uh, I was at Oklahoma State, so I knew how to march. I knew how to take a Springfield rifle apart and put it back together. So anyway. But there was a lot of physical training that uh, they put us through, and it was uh, the first day was getting used to just getting up and that raspy voice, uh, corporal charge of quarters, uh, getting used to him. Because again, this pipeline of aviation cadets going to pre-flight was kind of full, they sent several of us uh, to what they call college training detachments, CTD, and I was one of those. They, when we finished uh, basic training, we were sent to uh, different schools. I was sent to Austin College in Sherman, Texas, again, a short distance from uh, Wichita Falls. So I stayed there about, I can't remember exactly, it was six, it was nine to 12 weeks. And you take some college courses in physics and math, you know, some higher math courses. It was really good. Uh, and you also take a test before you go in, and I did pretty pretty well in that, so I was one of the first group to go out to pre-flight. We had some ground school, you know, uh, Morse code. We learned to send and receive Morse code, uh, aircraft identification, some other basic things. But mostly it was uh, physical training. They really put you through, uh, and it was right in the middle of summer, and uh, PT, physical training, uh, they tried to get it, I believe, at the worst time of the day at 11 o'clock, because I think it's when we had it, and we got, but you know, we were there for another 9 to 12 weeks, and by the time we left there for primary, we were in good physical shape, we knew how to send and receive code, and uh, Morse code, and pretty well up on aircraft identification, our own airplanes, uh, Japanese, German airplanes, and also naval ships, you know, they'd give you uh, a black and white uh, side view of a destroyer and you're supposed to be able to identify that as ours or, or Japanese or whatever, you know. So that's what we were doing in pre-flight. My first assignment was in uh, primary flight school in uh, Arkansas and uh, just south of Little Rock, Pine Bluff. And we flew a PT-19, a low-wing trainer. And that's where we were indoctrinated in our my indoctrination, really. Well, I got a few hours at, uh, when I went at Sherman, Texas, at Austin College. I got 10 hours in a Taylor craft, you know, never in, not, no solo time. So I did have that previous 10 hours at, in, in college, but then I went into primary, and then there you start in just a basic flying. Um, uh, you solo after a certain amount of time, within ten hours, I think most of it, most of us soloed eight to nine hours, and then you got into basic maneuvers, you know, turns, um, climbs, descents, and then you get into some. Shondells. A Shondell is you go down and just pull the airplane up and it was a um, a training for um, coordination, I'd, sh I'd say, of mm -hmm. how you handle the controls. And then from there you get a little bit of, air, uh, we got some instrument training, but it was basically flying in primary of flying S turns over a road, you know, making everything, making it standard where you could do it in your sleep. And then from there you go to basic, the next, after you finish primary, you were sent to the, to the next uh, base, which was 
in Kansas, uh, basic flight school, where we flew a BT-14 and a BT-13, and they were low-wing all-metal airplanes. Well, the BT-14 was all-metal. And there you got into your first aerobatics and, uh, uh, and instrument flying and formation flying. And once you accomplished those requirements, you went to advanced flight school. And I went to Pampa, Texas. So I was staying in the southeast, southwest, you might say, Arkansas and Texas. And I graduated at Pampa from Twin Engine. I went to Twin Engine Flight School, and they, they assign you. I don't think I was that good uh, aerobatically. That's why they sent me to Twin Engine School. And uh, But I graduated in April of 44 uh, as a, uh, and commissioned as a second lieutenant, and I was given my aeronautical wings as a twin engine rated pilot so and that's when I from that point on I was going overseas in some area I thought I was going to be a B-26 pilot uh, that's where I was originally signed at, to go to Shreveport Barksdale and I went there but they'd made a mistake and they had uh, too many pilots that had arrived uh, there didn't they didn't have computers in but they personnel people made them air somewhere so there was an overabundance of twin engine rated pilots and uh, so the Martin B26 I thought I was going to be flying on I didn't get to fly on they took a bunch of us and sent us to um, Bergstrom Army Airfield at Austin Texas and there I was uh, for troop carrier training and they had a real high priority at that time because we didn't realize uh, uh, D-Day was coming in a couple of months. But I, I, we were still in training when that happened, so we didn't get there. We were just uh, dumbfounded again by how big it was and how well everything seemed to be planned and how many troop carrier airplanes there were and, uh, and the paratroopers. Uh, and while we were at Bergstrom, we did fly some, and have you know we practiced dropping some um, tro uh, paratroopers a couple times. We pulled gliders, you know, CG4A. We towed single tow and then double tow, or you take off at night or day where you pull uh, two CG4As, and the C-47 really had to work to pull those two machines off the ground and get them airborne so that. You could get your C-47 airborne, and they did um, utilize that CG-4A in the uh, invasion of Normandy and uh, Europe and some other big battles over there. Our training seemed to take forever. It was like October we were finishing up, and by this time we were told we were going to go to CBI, China, Burma, India Theater, and it took a while to get there. You know you. You uh, finish your training in, in Bergstrom, and you, they put you on a train. And they send there's about 20 crews of us that were sent to um, by train from Austin, Texas, to Bear Field, which was in Indiana, Fort Wayne, Indiana. And then there we were um, given, uh, you, know, you know, overseas, uh, you know, a footlocker and some. Uh, gear that, that we would need to wear overseas, flight suits, uh, flight jackets, and that sort of thing. And then we were trained, and we were there about a week, and then we were sent by train again to Miami area to, uh, to await uh, our transport to, um, by this time, to, we knew we were going, still going to CBI, and to get there we would going to leave Miami by Air Transport Command, and at, at they, they were flying C-46s, and we'd be in the back end, uh, bucket seats, and um, so it took about a week or ten days there before we got on one of those. So, twenty crews, that's forty, about ten crews. Anyway, twenty crews and, and two different airplanes, 
there was four. Uh, our C-47 crew was pilot, co-pilot, radio operator, and a flight engineer. So there's four on our crew. So ten crews is 40 guys. Uh, so that was about a C-46 load with all your gear. To get there from Miami, we had to fly. The route from there was C-46 to Puerto Rico, uh, Belém, uh, Brazil. Um, what's the other place? Uh, we landed in Brazil, and then we switched to C-80. Well, it was a version of the B-24, uh, passenger version. We went to Ascension Island, across South Af uh, Gold Coast, Africa, uh, Khartoum. Anyway, that was our route to Karachi, India. Okay. That was India then, but now it's Pakistan. Okay. Anyway, um, and all that took a time. It took a time of a few days and weeks in Karachi. Uh, we were there. We leave. We really finished our training in October. We don't get to. Kunming, China. Uh, we get to Karachi, and then we have to be air flown by ATC to uh, uh, jumping off place uh, in India, but over the hump. And that took a few days again, waiting to get your ride over the hump into Kunming. So we arrived in uh, Kunming in the first part of December of forty-five, uh, forty-four. Excuse me and was immediately assigned to the 27 Troop Carrier Squadron, which was based in Yunnan Yi, which was about a uh, less than an hour, about, about an hour's flight in a C-47 from Kunming, west of Kunming to Yunnan Yi. That's where I eventually ended up with the 27 Troop Carrier Squadron. The 27th had been there a few months already before I got there, uh, flying these drop missions of dropping rice, they were airdrops of uh, rice that's packed in uh, burlap bags, four or five burlap bags, 60, 70, 80 pounds of rice in a burlap bag and tie it. They do that, put it in three or four bags. And we, t um, we supply that by airdrops to the Chinese Army. We'd also drop them medical supplies, uh, ammo, stuff like that. And um, but the Chinese were pushing the Japanese back, and uh, by this time when we arrive, uh, it's within 30 to 60 days before the Burma Road opened, so there's a lot going on. We were flying two to three missions a day of airdrops, and they were run at, um, first of all, it was about an hour. They got, kept getting further out from Yunnan Yi, but uh, about three hours you could do a round trip. You could do your airdrops, and you'd have four of your uh, troopers in the back that would push this, if you had rice, airdrop, uh, free fall. And you'd hope they didn't try to catch them. If they did try, they'd miss them. The Chinese, they were like little kids down there trying to catch these things sometimes. But they, three to 500 feet, we would circle over the drop zone, and they would, uh, they would be watching. The, our, they were very good. As long as we got over, you know, had our track figured out and made our circles, uh, they would kick out the rice at the right time, and 90% of it got where it was supposed to go, or the ammo. That was our combat there. There was some um, small arms fire sometimes. You know, the Japanese might be right over the hill. The, the hill. We're right in the foothills of the Himalayas, Himalayans, and uh, there was uh, always, if we had several drop areas. We had a primary drop uh, target and a secondary drop target. Uh, if weather prevented one from being used, we'd use another one or the other one, secondary, or maybe we had a third choice. And sometimes the winds were such we couldn't drop. Uh, we'd have to use. But we always had to. Uh, the terrain was was about as uh, bad as it could get, and sometimes the weather wasn't helpful. So. Sometimes you'd see the P-38s or the P-51s down the valley strafing and, you know, doing their thing. Uh, but we never really had anything but small arms fire. Maybe once in a while you'd get a hole, uh, an airplane would come back with a hole from a, like a 20 millimeter size uh, shell. But basically uh, that was our combat. And uh, then if uh, 
Sometimes we land on a, a grass strip in the area and bring back uh, severely wounded Chinese that lost limbs or arms or whatever. They put them on the C-47 with some medical, you know, attendees. We'd bring them back to Pao Shan, which was right on the um, Salween River. Uh, and they would take them off the airplane and put them in their hospital there. Then we'd come back, and if there was time, we'd run another mission. But in the, from about the time I got there until the Salween campaign was over, which would be about four months, I did fly 70 uh, airdrops. Uh, so, and then from that point on, we, we moved two or three more times, the squadron did, to other locations. We're airdropping this, uh, this, this time the rice. And you're, you're just praying one of those guys doesn't really catch one of these 70 pound bags. It's going to be fatal, I'm sure, if he did. But anyway, that and landing at this, bay, at this uh, airstrip and picking up those wounded. Uh, and then when we got to uh, Pal Shan, we had trouble. Um, had an experience there. We couldn't find the Chinese have a uh, a saying or a uh, an obligation if they help somebody that's uh, really handicapped that person becomes their uh, they, they're obligated to help that person from then on and we had pr uh, trouble getting all of our casualties off the airplane. And they had, we had to go get a Chinese officer, and uh, you know, he, uh, we've heard they even went further than what they did there that day. Of just, you know, he didn't pull his pistol, but he threatened to. And they, anyway, they got the the poor guys off the airplane and to the hospital. That that uh, that was just a, uh, an everyday sample, really. Then we had a. Later on, we had a mission we flew for the OSS, uh, Office of Strategic Services. That was a precessor of CIA. Okay. And we did some missions. That's where we, what we were doing in Chikyang on later on in the war. Uh, a 10-hour mission where we, two C-47s, uh, went way back into China there where the OSS people were operating. Uh, it took a while to get there and locate our drop area and to get back. We were escorted by two P-51s and they just they had, they had long-range tanks, external fuel tanks on their airplanes to keep them aloft that long. And they were at re reduced power and it was just really a great experience. Uh, well, number one, it was nerve-wracking in a way just to make, you know, are we going to be jumped by the Japanese? Are we going to find our target? The Japanese didn't bother us. We did have a little trouble finding our target. We had a navigator. And we did make our connection, and we come back, and, uh, and it was a successful mission. Uh, but we had the advantage in the, in the C-47 of being able to get up out of our seat and move around. The two P-51s, one was an American pilot of an airplane, the other was a Chinese pilot of an airplane. Mm -hmm. They had, when we landed back at, uh, we didn't get back to Chikyang, we had to land somewhere else. Um, we had to assist those pilots out, you know, help them get up out of their cockpit. They were so, you know, they'd been there 10 hours. Anyway, that was kind of a couple of missions I remember. We had some real long days after the war, you know, after the second atomic bomb, um, and uh, the um, and watching the uh, Chinese, the Japanese fly into uh, in their transport. Uh, it was a Mitsubishi uh, transport version of the Topsy. That's what we call uh, American version of the Topsy bomber. But the all these arrangements were made that we were unbeknown. We know we didn't know anything about. But they flew in after the second atomic bomb and. Um, escorted by a couple of P-51s that were unarmed. But anyway, after that, we were very busy hauling Chinese uh, 
Army and Marines into Shanghai and Nanking to start disarming the Japs, uh, the Japanese, and also hauling. Um, we were hauling. There was a there was a big POW camp in uh, Shanghai, where there was some uh, civilians that were interned there when the war started in '37, or still interned in in '45. There were some white Russians. Some British people, citizens, and uh, really emaciated. Uh, anyway, that was probably the most dramatic thing. Uh, we spent a couple of nights in Shanghai. Uh, and, uh, the Japanese were still there, and uh, they were not bothering us. We weren't bothering them. They would bow to you know, uh, but that. Uh, Hauling those civilians out was rather, rather um, to what they went through and what little we went through. And to what they really went, they had some very dramatic experiences. Uh, at that time, the the Burma Road was not open. All the eastern seaboard, uh, China seaboard cities that you could unload uh, gas, you know, gasoline supplies or any kind of supplies was was uh, controlled by the Japanese. And early on they built the Burma Road from Burma into China and then when the, the Japanese invaded India in uh, 43 and 44 in Burma, they shut off that road. And at that time they, that's when the hump flight started. So everything had to be flown over the hump. And what was so important about the Burma Road was to get the supply uh, stream opened again, and uh, and once that happened, uh, of course the Japanese by this time were they had they were on the defensive, you might say, very much on the defensive. And the Chinese, uh, with our help, they couldn't have really done it without air supplies because there was no roads. You know, there's two big rivers, uh, the Mekong and the uh, Salween were like, not almost like the Mississippi, but with more water, like our Chattahoochee, uh, only much wider. And um, anyway, it was it was vital to the Chinese. And uh, the um, when the Japanese invaded India and uh, had already controlled the eastern seaports, that's when. Uh, uh, Chenault, who had already gone and formed the AVG, the American Volunteer Group in China, uh, finally was getting attention from, uh, you know, the higher, you know, Hap Arnold and all the others, and Roosevelt and Churchill. When the, and then when, the, like I said, when the Japanese invaded India and started really causing havoc there, that affected the British. Well, Churchill gets involved. At that time, was when they uh, really started getting more help into China, and that's when. The, and the 27th troop carrier was moved from a training squadron into India first. They helped on the operations there before, you know, uh, getting mission uh, reopening North uh, Burma. But they they really were the suppliers, our, the 27th Troop Carrier and another Troop Carrier Squadron in supplying uh, General Wingate and General Merrill and uh, another uh, American general, um, supplying them and pushing the Japanese out of North Burma, and then the Chinese pushing the Japanese out of China. Uh, the, the, at this point they really needed some help and they moved the 27th out of India into China to help them. So they were there about six months before I got to the 27th in China, doing a real good job. That was a complete surprise, the atomic bomb. Uh, first announcement when they dropped the first one was uh, um, atomic bomb, you know, all kinds of, imagine, you know, your imagination goes rampant over that. Uh, and then a week later, there's a second one, you know, and um, immediately uh, there's talk of the war is uh, 
drawing to a close. So I go along with the um, uh, logic that it, it it speeded up the end of the war, and it actually did save lives, in my opinion. Because that uh, the Japanese already demonstrated in Iwo Jima and uh, well Guadalcanal, uh, Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima and uh, those other islands. T uh, what was the other one that was so bloody? They don't give up. And if we'd had to invade the main island of Japan, it'd been been awful for everybody. It was a time to celebrate, and there was some celebrations. Um, but we were still, China was kind of off the beaten path as far as, you know, we had, um, everything came to the Burma Road. I remember we, once a month we got our uh, PX rations. You know, you got a couple bars of soap, and if you, cho if you smoked, you got a carton of cigarettes. Um, and then you had to put the soap somewhere where the rats didn't get it. You know, the rats could chew through a wooden uh, footlocker and get to your soap. The Chinese, they you know, they farm every foot of their mountains. You know, they terrace them, and they did a lot of it then. And now you see a picture of China from the air, and it's it's beautiful. It's just all terraced, and they utilize every foot. We were really busy uh, with going into Nanking and Shanghai. Uh, uh, the most memorable experience I have of Shanghai, it was like going into an American city. Uh, uh, they had um, we had Chinese CN. CN was a currency. They had an occupation um, currency in Shanghai. And so we got a few of those dollars or what uh, currency. We, we traded our American for, by this time, the Chinese CN was about a thousand to one dollar, thousand CN. And then you take that CN into Shanghai and you get a whole bunch of. Uh, of uh, of, of uh, occupation money. Anyway, we the, the Park Hotel was like looked like a, it was a beautiful hotel. It was the only time we spent a night there. The only time in my life that I encountered, and this is a really a nice hotel, bed bugs. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Anyway, I slept on the floor. Okay. There. We were at Liangshan. Uh, uh, oh. Uh, about this time, one of our airplanes went up straight north, flew straight north. In fact, our CO made the flight, and he took uh, an experienced pilot with him as his co-pilot and a radio operator and a flight engineer, regular crew. They flew up to Mugden, Manchuria, to pick up General Wainwright. Uh, they, um, he was in a POW camp up there, and with Wainwright, they brought back uh, there was about 20 passengers on the airplane. There was several other generals, and a few sergeants, and a PFC. But I don't know how they arranged that, but they did. And the war was still on. But Wainwright was uh, the general in charge of uh, Corregidor. And uh, uh, when MacArthur left Corregidor and let, uh, turned it over, he turned all, all the army over to Wainwright. And then it just went downhill after that. And Wainwright, when he surrendered, and then the Bataan Death March, he survived all that. And he survived the uh, POW camp. He was just oh, skin and bones. Anyway, they flew him back into uh, Liangshan. Everybody got a brief look and a high. And they put him on a C-54 and flew him to uh, Tokyo. He was there for the surrender of the J Japanese forces in Tokyo Bay. In November of 45, we closed up our operation in uh, Liangshan. We left our airplanes, all of our ground equipment for the Chinese nationalists. Um, and we were flown by Air Transport Command to the Calcutta area to catch a ship there to come home. And incidentally, the uh, Red Chinese, they were all up in North China. Uh, they kind of had a truce going on during the war, the Nationalists and the Red China. And as soon as Americans were all out of China, it was soon after that that they, they fought for China. And Nationalists lost and they went to Taiwan. So 
Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, anyway, we left our airplanes and ground equipment there for them, and we went to uh, Calcutta, and um, we caught a ship there, uh, like the first part of January '46. It took 30 days to got on the ship right on the Hooghly River and uh, floated down it into the Indian Ocean. We went right by Singapore and Formosa. Thai, uh, uh, up around the Aleutians into Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting, and we had to wait a while to get on the ship, but when we did get on the ship, and we're going down the Hoogly River, H-O-U-G-L-Y, I think that's the way you spell it. Anyway, it's a real means of transport for the uh, Indian people. And there'd be these little wooden vessels that are powered by ro uh, you know, oars or maybe sails, and there'd be a guy out there in the back of the boat washing his face and drinking water out of this river. And we'd already seen a body or two floating down the river. You know, it was uh, Calcutta at that time was uh, just a mass of humanity, and I mean, it must be much more now. I can see what Mother Teresa ran into when she went there, you know. The, just uh, and people would die on the street, and if someone didn't take care of them, they'd stay there. You know, it was almost that bad. So, but it was really eye-opening to see how some people lived and survived, uh, like on the Hoogly River. It was just amazing. Went to Portland, and they um, went through. A, that was our port of debarkation. And uh, there was, was some army base there, I don't recall the name of it. We went through some paperwork and we were put on trains going to different destinations. My destination, our destination, I, the train I was on went to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. It was its final stop. It dropped off some people in Michigan and some other places. And at Fort Leavenworth was where I was separated out. And I, that's where I decided to stay in the reserves. and. Um, and in so doing, uh, when I got home, I got into a reserve unit at uh, Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma City. And it was recalled in 1951. We were flying Douglas A-26s when we were recalled and uh, ended up uh, flying B-29s in a strategic air command wing in uh, Roswell, New Mexico. So, um, But I stayed in and stayed active as much as I could, or even took um, uh, correspondence courses in the reserves when I was not near a air base. And I retired as a lieutenant colonel, so it worked out real good. I, um, and, I, and with my military flying, I, I became a pilot for a corporation, and I flew all my life. I, for over 50 years, I was a pilot. Uh, okay. I, as they said on the stockyards, you pilot here and you pilot there, but no, I was just... <laughs> But I grew up, my dad was on the stockyards, and then that's where I was going to be, in the cow business. Uh, but after I flew that first airplane ride, I decided that, I, and I really loved airplanes just from building them and making model airplanes, you know, mm -hmm. rubber-powered airplanes, that my uh, destiny was airplanes instead of cows or cattle. And uh, I know that uh, I never regretted it. Uh, I had been dating this girl, and we were never, we were informally engaged. Okay. Not, <laughs> I come home, and uh, and we, uh, in the meantime, she'd written me letters. She would really like me, when I came home, to get into medicine, to become a doctor. And so uh, when I got home, and I took a train to think about this and uh, to get my... You know, I mean, my folks were all going to meet me at the train station. I could have flown, but I decided to go on the train, and uh, they were all there. Come back, and the GI Bill was available, and yes, I did go back to school. But I already had three semesters in the School of Agriculture, animal husbandry, you know, judging cattle and horses and sheep. And now I switched to arts and science and uh, pre-med. So I... I get into my first semester of pre-med, and everything's going well. I'm making fairly good grades. You know, at that time, 
Or at that time, I should say, you didn't have to be a straight A student to get in med school. You do now, I think. I was making B's and A's, which was pretty good. I was studying hard. And I got a letter from my fiance, quote, quote, um, <laughs> telling me that she had met Dr. So and so. Uh, and uh, so I, uh, anyway, I called. Of Palm City and talked to her and um, made arrangements to see her that weekend. But by the time I get there, she's had an appendectomy, emergency appendectomy. So she's in the St. Anthony Hospital. So we did. We had a, a nice conversation. Uh, you know, that time you uh, an appendectomy, you might stay in the hospital four or five days. And she, anyway, that's where she'd had the operation. So we parted our ways there, but. Um, I lost my ambition to become a doctor. I didn't take full advantage, no. But I, um, I got a job flying for. I had a brother working for a cattle company in Amarillo, Texas. So that's where it started. I went to work, flying for a cattle company. And eventually got with an oil company and retired out of it. Came to Atlanta and flew several years here in the Atlanta area as a fill-in uh, pilot for companies that needed a pilot that's on vacation or something and actually the last 12 years I flew, I flew for a, a prominent um, member of the Atlanta business community and a great opportunity, a great airplane, a Challenger 601, a great pilot I flew with and uh, retired out of that finally. and. Uh, so now I'm just uh, I just work for my boss over there, Becky. <laughs> I saw the world. I went clear around the world, mm -hmm. half by air and half by water. Um, <clears throat> I found out how the other half lives, and it's tough out there. We're a fortunate country, a fortunate people. The um, they just so many good things, you know, about this country that it, when I was recalled, I almost stayed in. I had an opportunity to get a regular commission, and I came that close to getting it, and I'm and some reg have some regrets on that, but I had a, a very good career in corporate aviation, so. And I still stayed active in the reserves and uh, uh, was able to accomplish some goals there. But I, I'm a believer in military. I believe someday we'll have the draft again. I believe it's going to be good for the country. I think two years in the military is good for Maybe we don't need a draft, but we need, we do need a good, uh, uh, a strong military service. I was a kid when I went in at 19. I wasn't mature, but it teaches you maturity. Uh, you don't know. Uh, you've graduated from high school, and you don't really know what your career is going to be. I think it's a good opportunity to go into the military, and to accept this discipline and. Uh, and have the opportunity to serve your country, I think it's just a great opportunity. And it offers uh, a route for you, and it also gives you a vision for other routes, you know, or what you might, and you might, uh, I think they get GI Bill benefits now. So you get some, you can go, you get the college behind, or the military behind you, and you can go to college afterwards and, and really uh, expand your uh uh, what's available to you. The military is an honorable um, service that provides uh, all kinds of, you know, not only discipline, but it, uh, opportunities to learn all kinds of things. You know, they, they're into uh, high tech, the military is, they're into uh, uh, but I, I really encourage aviation, and I think that um, uh, what they get in aviation is just a tremendous uh, resource for them, a background to stay in the military, 
or industry. Liberty means um, that you have certain rights, but you have all these responsibilities. And um, if, uh, if we can all, you know, uh, be more responsible for our actions, uh, and we, uh, and the military is just a great way to learn those responsibilities, the basic responsibilities that go with liberty and the pursuit of happiness.